Hi, Matt. What's up? Am I sideways? You are sideways. Okay, I'll go this way. And not in a good way. Nice. <laughs> nice. <laughs> okay. Uh, we are live on YouTube. And three, two, one. We are live on Facebook. Cool. Hi, everybody. Nice. Oh, welcome to... The Better at Beach podcast and our elite member coaching session. Uh, here is one of our bi weekly meetings. Is it bi weekly if it's two per week, or does that mean every two weeks? Biannual. Uh, man, that's a great question. What is it? Write in your answers, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> no, because semi annual is every half year, biannual is every two years. Yeah. Yeah. So that's the answer there. Okay. Um, what we do here is we are coaching our elite members on betteratbeach.com. They've all signed up for our membership, and this is uh, one of their two weekly meetings. And we're all preparing for some kind of end of season tournaments, which is pretty exciting for everybody. I know I've been working with Logan and Hagen uh, yesterday, and we can talk about that a little bit if we have questions. But what we are going to do is we're going to ask all of our members. So members who are watching, I see you guys in the audience. Okay. And you're here for your video analysis and question session. I want you all to call in. So we're going to do one big group call like we used to do on Zoom. And we're going to run an experiment and see how that goes today. And I know uh, not many of you guys could make it. But I want you to start calling in so that we can see uh where you guys are at and i know that we have four people in the meeting and if you guys can't call in and you just want to throw in some questions via chat you are more than welcome mike awesome matt is struggling with his connection so we're just going to run this here what up mike what's going on how you doing man doing pretty good got a big stretch coming up so i'm excited to get out there Hell yeah. Uh, thank you for the feedback. Matt, share with me uh, all the feedback on the meetings. Uh, I think that those are the negatives and the cons, the same cons that you shared. We're like, yeah, it's a little less private, but we did promise ourselves that just for this month, we're going to go through with it uh, for our company and for getting the word out about what we do. It's It's crucial that people actually see what happens in these meetings. So for the part of the, the for the part of it that like might be uncomfortable, where it's a little less than private just during this month, um, I just hope you'll forgive us in knowing that we're trying to do the best for other players as well. I'm here for it. Cool. Um, all right, guys who are our other members, if you are on your desktop, obviously I want everybody to call in at the same time so that we can see what it's like to do the meetings like we used to do on Zoom where we just had everybody on the call at once so that everybody can talk when they need to. And we've got small enough numbers where that works. Mike, yeah. uh, what's that's coming? How is the new approach? Uh, yeah, still work in progress. Uh, I've realized that it's more important to actually get out there and replicate those motions in practice and in training than to just talk about it. You know, I really got to make my, make my body, uh, remember how to do it. So I got to just do more reps, got to get out in the training court. It's hard, uh, in new England sometimes, but, uh, you know, there's a lot I can do by myself too. Can you hear me? Um, I start over in a couple of seconds when we see you again. And this I can hear was you. one of the issues. Okay, you can hear me? Uh, I can hear you now, yeah. so go for it. Okay, did you hear my answer or should I repeat that? Uh, I'll redo the whole thing. Uh, you said okay. you're getting out to the training court and reps are important. Yeah, yeah, I, I didn't see enough change yet in my game film. So I just got to rep it out um, by getting out there. And even if I don't have like a full game going, just doing it by myself, just to try and ingrain the muscle memory of uh, like the right 
arm mechanic. I really liked what Logan said last week about uh, the hand under the ear. Whenever mm. I look at myself, I'm I'm way up here. I'm going like over my head, and uh, maybe that's just a symptom of having long long arms and long limbs. But uh, I want I want my arm swing to look more like uh, I see on um, on you know the AVP. Okay, um, well, there's a lot of different guys on the AVP have a, a world of different arm swings. So, who would you say is one that you absolutely, definitely want to replicate? Hmm. Oh, God, thanks. I think a little bit. I will say it's funny to watch pros and and how many people have not pristine mechanics. They all have similar uh similar mechanics and they follow those same principles but you know even somebody kind of like uh logan doesn't quite pull the trigger as much as he could and we were working on that a little bit yesterday um hagen was losing some power yesterday because he would get his elbow way up high and he would snap mm -hmm. from there instead of really fully loading so he lost uh a little bit of power there i remember uh clemens uh, when Ben Vaught was playing with Clemens, he had the straight on pow, but he had so much power from it. Are you ever going to yeah. teach that high elbow to load before the swing? No, we're, we're going to pull this trigger. So that, like you're scratching your chest uh, in order to get that swing going. But <laughs> it's, it's funny that not everybody has great mechanics and we, we even like MLB or major leagues, you know, there'll be announcers that say like, you guys are, uh, this this pitcher isn't really throwing like you would teach at home, and they'll they'll use complimentary words like this very unorthodox windup, which means that no one would teach it, but mm -hmm. somehow it found a pathway for this person, and they're athletic enough to, uh, and they've gotten the hours to make it efficient. So yeah. uh, that long-winded response uh, being said, who do you think has a beautiful arm swing that you want to replicate? I don't know. I feel like. Taylor Crab has a really nice one. I mean, he's just fluid in general, but like, mm -hmm. and he's not really who I would pick for a one to one for myself. Um, he's just like a natural volleyball athlete and it just looks so easy for him. Um, it's really quick. Um, he doesn't really have a, you know, I've, I've watched myself a lot and I'm used to like just drawing back, waiting there for a moment where he's, he's like so fluid. So, uh, yeah, I, I really should pay more attention to arms that I've seen. I see a lot of guys that are like circular, you know, really low, like like an indoor, mm -hmm. and they'll come by. But I just can't do that. <laughs> yeah, um, it does get weird. You need a, a bit of vertical to be able to do that. But also, if you pull it back, I think too many people make the mistake yeah. of my double arm lift means that both of my arms come all the way up above my head. And when you see coaches demonstrating that. That's actually what they're explaining, but that is not what happens. And it's especially not what happens the lower you jump. So like for, for women who are maxing out at 34 inches, 35 inches might be incredibly elite um, for, for a female volleyball player. That's not high enough. 35 inches, I would say that my max was maybe 36 or 37 in my career, maybe. Um, high enough either to get both of my arms above my head and and throwing them so for most people you should start that drawback with your right arm right below that nipple line and then it's just gonna, gonna come across here instead of making your hand to go up above your head and uh, some people have to do that but like the freak athletes if you watch like Lionel marshall um who he's got a bunch of those 50 inch vertical uh highlights on youtube mm -hmm. that guy threw him all the way up and then he had time to pull back in the air because he's in the air for so long. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. If you look at like, you know, when I do a jump max test, you know, I'm going to throw, I'm going to crank both arms back and I'm going to reach them both really high. Mm -hmm. But I got to, I think maybe understand that you're not really trying to jump as high as you can and touch the max point on your swing. Really. It's just about the sound mechanics uh, and trusting that, you know, when you reach high in that swing, you're going to be tall enough and, mm -hmm. you know, you want to start optimizing that way rather than let's see how high I can touch. Now let's start an arm swing. Then you're kind of stuck where I've got both arms here. Now I'm trying to turn back. 
but you know this harm this, this hand's already way up here so uh it's a very interesting uh little study and i know it works differently for everybody but i want it to work better for for me so that might have to be just like study what's out there and then and then toy around with it experiment a little bit yeah so. okay um what about the approach uh as the right side making sure that your hips are a little bit more open to the court instead of towards that corner has that made any difference we were working on that very specifically yesterday with transition setting um for all four of the guys that i was working with and they're all the uh um they all qualified for the main draw in manhattan this weekend and they were all missing it and then once they applied it it was like oh boom all of a sudden we have great transition swings so have you been working on that at all yeah so you're saying i'm not the only one that struggles with that <laughs> most people don't know about it yeah <laughs> that's the crazy part until you find those your left foot is pointing in the wrong approach. Yeah. What? Like, <laughs> how would you ever know that unless you're working with somebody who's seen it, been through it, felt the pain, and then under. Open to the court, you're going to get trapped on your left arm a lot. You're, you're not alone. <laughs> Good to know. Good to know. Yeah. But has it <laughs> made a difference in your side out and your power capability? Yeah. Yeah. It, it feels more comfortable for sure. I haven't, you know, statted it yet to find out. Uh, and it's hard to, to um, I, I need a lot more reps in to, to know if it's really working, but I'm just trusting in the process right now that if I can uh, uh, implement that change and the arm swing change, everything will sync up and, and uh, it'll look a lot better and hopefully be more effective. But same thing, just got to rip it out. It's uh, not enough to just – because what happens, I think, my a lot, is I, I'll get into games with like a three or four cues in my head. And sometimes it's it's easy to, to let one or two of them slip. So that's what's next for me is uh, repping them out so much that they're second nature that I don't even have to think about them consciously. I can just kind of let, let it uh, happen naturally. Yeah, what are your go-to cues, right? By the way, good to see you guys. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, what are your go-to cues right now, Mark, or Mike? For passing, it's arms out early, um, extending them while the ball's coming over the net. And that's been a huge help this season for me. Nice. Heck yeah. Uh, and then the two that we've been working on with Mark have been um, keeping the, hip, the hips and the toes pointed at the deep middle. Because I'm a right side player, have the bad habit of trying to open my hips and close them to yeah. generate power. When in reality, I should be letting my torso do all that work. So, yeah, those are just a couple of things I'm working on. Yeah, it is. I was I was just training, just like focusing in on two or three cues this morning, uh, and, and it was with JM and the coaches, and it's so crazy how percentage wise your side out right goes up so quickly when you just narrow it down to a few things rather than having such a broad focus um so that's that's cool you're starting to see the fruit of that nice mike uh do you have any film for us today and pablo uh do you have any questions or film i'll let pablo go first i've been talking <laughs> Uh, no, I don't have any film. Actually, I did record some games yesterday, and then a ball knocked down the camera. And no. It. Yeah, it's like I got like uh, 45 minutes of the ground. Uh, <laughs> oh, so I man. I've been there. That sucks. Yeah, that is was, the like, worst. Dude, like AVP matches qualifiers, a ball hits it, or somebody yeah. sits in front of it not knowing that it's there, or what happens all the time, the phone overheats. And it's like, oh, yeah, that's, oh that's, sucks. Man, and I, I thought I got some good hits. And I was like, oh, I'm going to show these. And I'm going to get feedback on that. I was excited. <laughs> I got nothing, man. <laughs> that's all right. All right, Mac. Um, then, Mike, let's get you getting those clips up. I do see somebody put in here serving practice. That's Mike. Cool. Um, guys, volunteer your clips. Let's go. Utilize it. And then ask questions. Uh, 
All right, I'm going to share this screen and we'll check it out. Mike, lead us through uh, the questions and what you want to look at here. Yeah, so the biggest question is to, for today is, you know, how, how much should I be working on my float serve? You know, I, I'm not a jump server. I kind of resign myself to that. I'm a full-time blocker, so uh, I'm running up the net usually. So I, I want to see if there's anything that uh, I could be doing better on my, on my jump float. It's, <laughs> I don't know. There, once people have the mechanics of a jump float, there's only so much you can do, in my opinion. Um, because the only people that were teaching true, like, hey, we need better mechanics. Like, I was working with my 10-year-old niece, right? She, strength-wise, it takes all of her effort to be able to get a ball over the net, like, us here, most of us sitting in this meeting, okay, the four guys in this meeting, we could sit on our butts and probably fist a ball over the net, like with, with not much issue at all. So to say we need a bunch of mechanics and power, uh, float serve, I think it's just about reproducing. Can you reproduce it consistently? And what's your mentality? So one of the things that I'm looking at here from this last angle that you were giving us, Mike, Mm -hmm. is unless you're working on the high deep serves, these are not aggressive floats. So I would say that one of the things more people could focus on is basically what the, the Netherlands and the Germans did for a long time is just aim at the tape mm -hmm. and like hit the tape. Don't try to avoid it. Act like you're trying to hit the top of the tape and the flatness and the power from that, you start seeing how much impact you can give the ball and it still stay in. But when mm -hmm. it starts clearing a foot or two feet above the net, you have to hit it slower. So it definitely becomes more of a meatball and the jump float allows us to say, okay, let me get a better angle. So now that I can hit it flatter. So if you're jump floating and the ball is still crossing two or three feet above the net, you you're wasting jumps there's really no point um mm -hmm. it should definitely be a more aggressive thing and if you're just tall you know and you don't want to bother with the jump because you think it gives you inaccuracy then you could just reach high and the float serve is one of those things where okay is the high elbow prep going to hurt you in a float no because you don't need your max power there so we'll be able to develop enough power but like i said with my 10 year old niece all right, for her float serve, I had to teach her how to rotate, draw her elbow back and low, and then fire. She was doing this thing where she uh, brought the top of her hand towards the back wall to prep, so almost like a wooden soldier, but continue it on behind, and then she would come forward. So there's no power there, like coming from your – essentially, that only comes from your lats now um, instead of rotation from your shoulder. So we had to work on that with her. But for a, a guy like you, an open player, it's more mentality-based and definitely repetition. And these serves that I'm seeing here are just clearing the net way too high. You know, it looks like you're giving the ball to somebody instead of attacking the net. Um, so that would be the only commentary that I could get from this here, it looks like you're contacting in front of you. That's fine. You're getting 12 inches high, higher, which is good. <clears throat> now we just need to flatten that out because every ball is coming off of up off of your hands. And you're what, 6'5"? Yeah. Yeah. So when you jump, your hands, like in a soft jump, your hand is probably a foot above the net already. So there's no way that ball should go up off of your hand. No, and that yeah. would be really the only feedback there is let's uh, one of my favorite words from Jeff Alzina, who was coaching USA for a while. He, it was put some ping on it, like ping your float serves. Don't put them in. And once you started doing that and like adding just a little bit of extra wrist, it's, oh, okay, I could, I could put some stink on it. Yeah. Um, I also want to make my floats dance a little bit more, and I think they're just spinning too much, so they're way too easy. Where do you like to think about contacting it on your hand? 
The only thing about a float serve is that wherever the exact diameter is, your trajectory, the line of your hit, how it goes through the ball, goes directly through the middle of the ball. So that can be, you know, from, uh, what is it, 5 o'clock to 11 o'clock. That can be from 4 o'clock to whatever. That can be from 3 o'clock to 9 o'clock. Um, that's the only thing that matters with a float is getting that true trajectory and then mixing it there for all of those people who are listening or at home if you feel like you can't hit float because it always turns into topspin the best solution that i ever got and it happened immediately was put reverse spin on the ball see if you can uh, my coach told me to scrape down instead of hitting forward and when i did that i put a little backspin and i was like that didn't work he goes now you just find the middle zone. And now that we've gone to that side, we're fine. Like all you have to do is calibrate between the middle, but you were spending so much time trying to move an inch from your top spin that you never would have found a float. So a lot of times when we're coaching, we put people to the opposite end of the spectrum where they are, not because that's where we want them to go, but because they need to get it through their thick skulls that a big change has to happen. Like you can't go small change here. If I'm seeing something, I'm seeing it drastic and obvious. So we need a massive sweeping change. So that's when I'll say like, no, you need to set higher. No, you need to set higher. Okay. You didn't listen the first two times. Send this ball to the goddamn trees. Like if you don't hit the leaves above this court in this park, you're getting off the court. And then they, they do it sarcastically. And I'm like, okay, three feet lower than that. <laughs> You know, and they realize how much power they, they actually need to have or, or how much input. So same thing for you. If you're struggling, that gets going top spin. Start playing with the opposite of that. See if you can put some down spin on a couple. And if it works out that when you think down spin, it turns into a perfect float, we're set. Job's done. Yeah. Sweet. I'll try that. Thanks. Yeah. Uh, since we're on the serving, can I ask a question as well? Um, no. Go ahead. <laughs> All right, I'll <laughs> um, go ahead. I'm just so when I serve, I my main focus is location. Like I'm trying to get the ball to a certain spot where it will get the the, the person receiving to move. But that means that I don't come off. It doesn't come out with a lot of power. Like it comes out okay, but it could come with a lot with a lot more power. But then I lose accuracy. So I'm kind of wondering. You know, I, I'm. As I move to a higher level, now people are passing my serves just fine. And I'm thinking, well, okay, I need to change. Do I need to change things up? Or is this going to be like how it's always going to be that, you know, at the higher level, people are just going to pass these serves all the time? Or should I try to hit it with more power and sacrifice location? Are you accurate? float serving or spin serving? Uh, float serving. Float serving? Yeah. Float serving isn't about power. Because you can't even say power. You can say ping or zip, mm -hmm. but you know, you're not going to ever crush a float serve. Um, so it needs to be quick. The ball needs to get there quick, but it's never going to get there hard. So all those people that think that they have a float serve that's not hard enough, it is, it is a slow moving serve. What we want to prevent as much as possible, the same thing with our shots and our offense, what we want to prevent is any arc right mm -hmm. if we're thinking about deep but I, I i really think that most people miss the point of float surfs like the the float makes people uncomfortable so sure if it doesn't float and you're putting spin uh, you're missing a little bit a, a little bit of the point but a float serve is a spot it should be some spotted things and you should be way more accurate with the float and there should be a design that is not with the intent of an ace. We do not float serve for aces. We float serve to put somebody in a position or to cause a certain movement in their body. If we serve at their neck really flat, it's kind of dangerous because uh, that is most people's sweet spot. Like if you serve that zone, and I see this at juniors tournaments nonstop, everybody has the same exact serve. It's just flat. People hit each other and the passer doesn't have to move. And they pass between their shoulders and their knees. 
you haven't caused any movement. You haven't caused any body shape change. So you're allowing them to do the technique that they practice while standing still, right? I like to think of, can I make this person move on two planes of movement? That's nice. So if I want to serve them short, I don't serve short in front of them. I serve short into the middle or short into the sideline. So now they have to move forward and sideways. And if they're moving away from the court, trying to pass back in, I think that's a huge advantage. Okay. Um, if I can get their chest to pop, you know, or I can get their arms to go above their shoulder, I've changed the shape of their body. And in order to do that, when I say, you know, when I say, hey, serve this fl uh, float, serve deep, most people misunderstand me and they hit the ball so that's going to land deep, but that's not the point. Deep means make this person tomahawk or take two or three steps so that their feet are on the back line when they pass. Now I've doubled their approach length, right? But people serve deep, so they go flat and the passer doesn't move and it's the same serve as your regular serve. So if you cause somebody to tomahawk and serve receive, you've already won the first battle because any one of us sitting right here and any elite player, if I asked you to, you know, you, in order to save your life, you had to pass to yourself with forearms for 10 minutes. And then the same scenario, <laughs> save your life. You need to tomahawk to yourself for 10 minutes straight. We, we'd have a lot of bodies uh, in the tomahawk scenario. <laughs> <laughs> um, so if you, if you're falling victim to that, if you're tomahawking and serve receive, you're losing that first battle. You're starting every first, every point, a step behind. Uh, if you are causing somebody to tomahawk, you've got to consider that, yes, this is golden. Statistically, this is going to work out. And if I see someone tomahawk and serve receive, I'm going to that same spot, that high, slow, sleepy serve all day. You know, because I know statistically they won't be as accurate. Uh and the other ones are, 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 of course, short serves, right? Short serve does what to somebody? Let's name all the, the advantages. Go ahead. What is it? it? Sharpens the approach. Okay, it can. Yeah, against most unskilled, untrained players. Uh, but nobody in Better at Beach gets their approach length taken away by a short serve because because we they call we it tall man's medicine, right? What is that? They call it tall man's medicine because uh, tall people usually have a tough time getting those short serves. I love that. Yep. Uh, you're making somebody who doesn't want to bend their knees and doesn't want to get to the ground down. Okay. My daughter's about to go to sleep. <laughs> okay. Um, what else? I feel like people tend to try to shoot their platform, which makes it inconsistent. Yep. You cause platforms to come out way later. So now the setter doesn't get a good read on the passer and the pass is definitely inaccurate. And I give this all the time, like kind of like firearms training. I wouldn't, if I need to shoot something, right. I wouldn't make my gun appear and then shoot it and then make it disappear. And that's what people do with passing. They just pop up and that's not accurate. We need to track our target constantly. Um, so that's great. Late platforms. It's just taxing. Vision. Yeah, it's vision taxing. Is. Tired. energy yeah. yeah all day here's i mean we had a uh, i've had a couple of teams where we had a lot of great first sets uh teams would just serve my partner short and we'd side out and we'd crush them and we'd have a great first set and then we'd kind of gas out at the end of the second and then we were just really legs were taken out by the third so that's a long-term deposit play saying <laughs> you can't say hey we're gonna tire him out with short serves and then ever serve their partner right you can't say man it's not working after one set <laughs> if anybody you're playing gets tired from short serves after one set you know if they don't belong on the court anyway you need you need to condition you need to be ready for that but running and blocking plus rallies plus heat plus taking short serves and if they're a power hitter what means they need to now use more energy to get themselves up Oof. that's going to be tough to last that third set but regardless if every team in the tournament subscribes to that 
this team isn't going to be a problem in the semis. So that could be like a piranha mentality. You know, <laughs> like everybody takes a little pound of flesh and then by the end we've knocked down this monster. So, yeah, so there's a lot of advantages to that short serve, the high deep serve, um, but it's not about power. It's about changing the shape of where they go. And then a couple other advantages, like if we serve inside, because we know that this person, uh, if you guys know Alisson from Brazil, he just always used to love hitting by the antenna. No matter where he passed from, he always kicked out and he hit wide balls because he had this power cross that was very hard to stop, um, is very hard to stop. So in order to drag him in, we're going to try to serve middle and maybe short because now he's got to do this big loop to get deep enough for the approach and outside. So we've changed the offense that he wants to run because we've set up the chessboard in this way. We've made it more difficult to get him for him to get to his comfort spot. And again, this is, it won't work the first time. It won't work the second time, but it's a statistical play. Uh, I, I mentioned to Jake again, uh, Jake Arutia, who we were practicing with yesterday. Uh, he was like, man, I just like can't get a dig. And I looked at him. It was a set to 21. He had like nine digs. I go, Dude, to win an AVP, you need to average five digs per set. That's one dig every eight points. And his eyes kind of lit up. He's like, oh. I guess I don't have to worry if I don't dig a ball for three points in a row. Right. You need like the fifth or the sixth one. So these are, when we talk about strategies, they're statistically based, which means that team is still going to win the point more often than not. But you, if you stick to that strategy and it's sound, then you're going to lead, um, you're going to get those points, but it's going to be chip away. It's not going to be a waterfall. I get the same feelings, Mark, about blocking. I know that at the highest level, you're at 1.8, 2.0 serves or blocks per set. So sometimes I'll go a whole set without even touching a ball. And I'll think, do I even do my job there? But I comfort myself thinking that if I placed my block well and I made them shoot higher or I took their primary comfort zone away, then I technically did do my job, even if I didn't touch a ball or get a terminal block. I'm at least forcing the play forcing the play a little bit more. Yeah. Isn't that interesting that you could do an amazing job as a blocker, yep. but your buddy gets all the glory Yeah, <laughs> because people are so worried about avoiding you hitting higher um, that you might, you might touch a couple or you might not touch a couple. But if your friend has seven digs, eight digs in that set, you don't need to change a thing. You don't need to get frustrated. You are earning those points collectively. Uh, but, if your guy's below five digs per set and you're not touching anything or you're not getting peel digs, you need to help. You need to recalibrate. Something is going wrong. And Jake, what's his name? Gibb. I just said, what's his name for Jake Gibb? Um, Jake Gibb had a, a podcast a while ago where he was just like, it's not, a, it's not always about blocks per games. It's am I affecting this person? And if you feel like they can just hit cleanly and they're not paying attention to you or you're not getting some slow down touches or causing them to go higher or causing them to like freak out in the air because you changed something, uh, then you're not doing your job. So you can write on, am I affecting them even though I'm not getting blocks per game? And this is where you can have a six, one guy or like a five, eight girl that now they can be a blocker which is not truly recommended that you stay up, but are you somehow getting in this person's head? And I'll just share one anecdote. There was this guy, Ira Kinchin, who used to wipe the floor with me when I started. Um, he would run this fake drop, come up and block. And I would be like, he's gone. And I would go and I would like try to toast him. I'd bang it, and but he was only six foot. And then he would get a block touch and they would get a dig. And then he would do the exact same thing, except this time he would peel. So even though he's 6'1 and he wouldn't touch a high line if I went for it, he was messing with me through uh, just the positional gameplay and what I saw out of him. And it was very effective at it. So you don't have to be a monster to affect somebody. You just have to figure out your best version of affecting them. For a lot of shorter blockers, it's definitely a lot of peels and 
you know, kind of very sometimes an obvious to, obvious to, obvious to, and then appeal. You know, so you like get them like, oh my God, they're running this again. It's open all day. And then you've got your one out of eight. Done. No. Mm -hmm. Travis, you got anything for us? Um, yeah, actually, uh, drawing back to the short serves, um, question on that one. Uh, for landing short serves, apart from repetition, do you have any tips? I've got a couple, Matt. You want to lead off? About, the first thing I thought of was just, I mean, obviously going back to what we were talking about a second ago about cues, specific cues per, per skill. And I think one good one for a short serve is really trying to your apex close to, I don't know, maybe like mid court on your side, like the apex of your serve, rather than mm. having an apex lay. Apex is really important if you're trying to serve it short, because then you have to keep it close to the net. So you have to find a way or like a, a good spot on your side of the court that it's going to apex. And I think like, just past from the back line would be a good spot for apex or like about halfway that would be a good thing to play with so not so much of rep after rep after rep it's all right let's see what it looks like if i apex at this part of my court all right let's see what it looks like if i apex at this part of my court like so distance from the net to the back line wise um but yeah just play with the apex a little uh, and rather than doing a lot of reps, just do smart reps and take notes. Hmm. I think that's what cool. I, would, I would say. I like that. I kind of visualized almost like aiming at 9 o'clock, 9.30, 10 o'clock, 10.30, you know, mm -hmm. seeing like where I would aim if I were on the 3 o'clock side of a clock, like just kind of yeah. checking it out. That's interesting. I like that. Yeah. I love, I love um, picking a corner on my back line and serving from there to the opposite short corner. Like that gives me so much room to work work with too. Whereas like if I'm going straight on, it's a little bit more to to find that short length. Uh, for me personally, I just feel like it's easier to pick a corner on the back line and then serve the opposite corner or yeah, mainly the opposite corner. I don't really go very much short to the same side, but hmm. which would probably be something I need to add to my repertoire too. So. I probably need to play with that a little bit more. Yeah. It's nice. I I kind of like standing just outside somebody and keeping it outside them sometimes. Um, but when I'm choosing a short line serve, I make sure that I serve from either half court or their side. So I actually do the opposite. And there's going to be advantages. You have to see where the wind is and you have to see what this person's doing. But you can run the same serve position or sorry the same serve spot but just choose to serve it from a different position and say huh the problem is people think it's a point and then they think okay now i gotta change it up <laughs> like what like if you hit a button and it gives you money just keep hitting the damn button you know you might if you choose to hit another button the whole machine might shut off and it's done forever you know, it's like if you're flying in a dream, don't land. Just keep flying because otherwise then you get that like you kind of fall and then it turns into long jumps and then you can't fly at the end of your dream. It sucks. Uh, I don't know if you guys have that same dream. I think I got problems. <laughs> uh, uh, Mark has some things to talk about. Right? <laughs> fly. Fly. <laughs> uh, Travis, I, I would also experiment with a, a dead ball. Have you have you watched the serving part of the Ultimate Defender course? No. Okay. Uh, we talk a little bit about the float serves versus uh, a short float serve versus a dead ball float serve. And what I call the dead ball is if you keep the exact same trajectory, but you hit it slower or you use a different surface in your hand and then it just dies sooner. Mm -hmm. So this is one of those like three or four serve strategies where I'll hit somebody in the chest, hit them in the chest, hit them in the chest. And then I'll use the exact same. So instead of a short serve where I go up, now that person knows that it's a short surf. Mm -hmm. I hit the exact same trajectory, but slower. So the ball just, bleh, just runs out of energy and dies. 
And that works really well in windy conditions with, with some headwind as well, um, because it just kind of like stop as if, as if it hits a curtain and then it drops. Um, that's a very good way to hide a short surf. So it's a very feeling thing. And it took me, honestly, it, it took me like a year and a half, two years to, to really get it or understand it. But I now will actually use a different part of my hand because then I could use the same arm speed, but because now I'm using it a little bit higher on my hand instead of the hard uh, heel of my palm, because that surface it will make the ball pop a little bit slower, then I keep my arm speed the same, but now the ball dies. It's very similar if anybody knows change-ups, how change-ups work in baseball. Your arm speed is usually exactly the same, but due to the grip that you use, you don't actually throw it as fast. Um, you throw from like your palm instead of your finger pads in baseball and similar, but different volleyball, instead of now striking with the heel, maybe you just let your hand relax a little bit on contact and use more of the middle of your hand. You don't have to, that's one way. That's the way that I do it. But the main part is, can you use the exact same trajectory and make the ball land in different depths of the court? And if you master that, it can be pretty destructive. Cool. I like that. Yeah. Um, I do have some footage. I'll throw it in the chat. Um, it was um, setting drills um, cool. for 17 seconds is some digging, but uh, yeah, I've been working on setting with Matt. All right. Let's go. I'm excited Let's to see go. The starting point was great. And then we got some new drills for you. So I'm excited to see you. It, it wasn't exactly the way um, you had uh, suggested we alter it, Matt, um, but it is on sand. It is on uh, a court with a bunch of actual volleyball players. Um, so yeah, hopefully it should be a little better. <laughs> okay, a little bit far away. Uh, for our... Travis, which one are yep. you? I'm, I'm the one in blue, and I've, I've cut the clip, so it's just my sections each time. Nice. Okay. Um, in the future, you know, can you get us closer to the court? And just the way that we share video, if you can go horizontal with some of these, okay. uh, that would be good. But if you're making reels and, and you're going viral, then, of course, you got to do this, but still uh, yeah. get, get us closer to the action. Yeah, no, no, no reels or virals. Um, but yeah, yeah, I was, I guess I just set up the camera so I'd get the whole court, uh, for more so gameplay. Um, and I didn't adjust for, um, drills. Okay. One thing I'm seeing just a little bit of is the direction of your hips. Sometimes your hips go away from where you want the ball to go. Right. Yeah. This one was a little bit better. That one, your hips went straight up and you're trying to push it wide. That one, your hips kind of went nowhere and it was in front of you. Yeah, so it to me, some of these look, just in terms of like perfection wise, you know, not everybody's gonna send their hips exactly in the direction of the ball, but it looks to me like you're getting under the ball, really far under the ball so that you don't have the ability to push forward. Mm -hmm. I would say if you kept your feet just slightly more behind it and then you pushed forward as if think like walk forward through your set, you know, like okay. that one, that was a, that was a really good one. Let me see this. You know, this had some, a little bit of forward momentum, right? No, not that one. That's a backward step. Neutral. Neutral. Yeah. So it, that one, there we go. See how your body goes towards and through the ball? Yeah. Yeah. You'll have a little bit more power there instead of it going or the ability to send it far away from you. Because I think you're taking it over your hairline and forehead a lot, especially on that one. Mm -hmm. So now you won't have much ability to send that ball forward. I would say more of a mouth or cheeseburger position. Okay. Um, but I want to also hear what Matt has to say. Oh, look at Jennifer That's Aniston. Great. She still got it. Yeah, she does. Just go with it. It's such a good. Uh, <laughs> but I, uh, one thing I've noticed with yours, Travis, is sometimes you step 
your you plant your back foot or excuse me, you plant your front foot first and then plant your back foot. And uh, my cause is the uh, whether it's too uh, too far under it. So that one right there, you kind of planted your left foot first and then your right foot. Can you rewind to that one more? This one most recently. Uh, right he's here? setting. He's from the ocean side. Let's see. Yeah. Right. That's a good one. That one was good. Is well, that was a little different. That's a good one. That one, that little scorpion. That yeah. yeah. So you did your front foot, and then you planted your back foot. So it takes away all of, them, and you kind of your back foot a little bit more rather than pushing off of your back foot into your mm. front foot if you could find because there's a there's a lot of them that you do really well and then there's a couple of them where you kind of like plant your front and then your back which we always want to be moving back to front back to front um so if you could just build that consistency i think you'll see a lot more power that you can put um, and then consistent placement too, rather than if you're setting from the going left, right, and like having that front foot plan, planning that at last, uh, it takes away a lot of power that you can put into the set. But a lot of them you do really well. A lot of them, I mean, especially, it seems like you're, you're more natural from that side, from the yeah, I've been playing a lot more on the right side. Uh, most of my partners usually play left, so I've been, yeah, I guess getting more reps in on that side. Yeah, it looks more natural on that side. Hmm. How do you tend to go a little bit more up and down sometimes? Like, the miss on this side is... The miss on the left side is first foot or front foot first and then back foot. So... I don't really know what that means, but yeah, maybe that's could just be, you know, sense. mandating your technique over time uh, and getting just, oh, you know, continually more and more strict with it. But athletically, listen, you're, you're going to have to use other footwork. You know, it won't always be right, left, right, left. And then sometimes you just need a rebalance step. Don't let that turn into a nightmare. Don't let that freak you out. We're still athletes. You can, I mean, you could set from your knees, you could set diving um, and still put quality. But if we're going to be consistent over time, I think your lineup or, or how you're approaching the ball, instead of thinking that you need to be under it, mm -hmm. think about, all right, how do I draw a line through the ball to my target? And then I come from three feet behind the ball. You know, so you're always approaching from behind the ball in relationship to your target instead of waiting under the ball and making sure you're facing your target. It's like an actual, you're developing a line of pursuit that allows you to drive straight at where you're setting. And that should allow you to have more options and a little bit of better flow. And you won't have those weaker sets where the ball's behind you. And now you do this booty bump and you set a little bit lower and, and straighter up. Cool. I like that. That's a good pursuit. Cool. Yeah, it's extra work, which sucks. Uh, like you, you actually have to move farther, but we're talking like two and a half feet farther with every approach. And then once it becomes automatic, it becomes automatic. So you're fine. And better to do that initial work and then save your partner a shitty set. And so. Very I agreed. To the, the hitter too, it's, I feel to see that starting about three feet behind the ball it's communication wise like everything's moving towards where he's setting this ball oh mm -hmm. this is super easy to see where he's about to set this so communication wise with your hitter uh that's a set that i don't like for my setter not to have uh wrapped out I, I love to see my setter starting the same fluidity every single time no matter what set i call for it's it's And we'll add that little little burst of advantage that you get, like if there's wind, and you you're always taking it very high. Now it's almost impossible to set cleanly if there's a gust of wind, uh, and we usually 
we're, I'm not saying that we're that what so many people say that we're not athletic enough to take a backward step and be athletic in volleyball. Like every other sport can somehow backpedal and be athletic, but we can't, uh, it's ridiculous. <laughs> so, but you definitely move forward faster. Your body is designed to move forward faster and quicker because you got those calves working for you. So leaving the ball slightly more in front of you rather than at the limit of, of on top of you or behind you is going to give you more of an advantage when it comes to gusting wind. Cause you can adjust forward faster than you can adjust backwards. So there's that advantage as well. Cool. Thanks guys. Yeah. You're welcome. Hey Mark, while we're talking about setting, uh, I noticed something that I've, I'm curious if you noticed it too. Uh, on the world tour, especially, I see a lot of uh, guys who, as they're jogging up to help go deliver their handset, they almost give like a pump fake with their hands. Have you, have you seen this before? It's like Mark um, uh, Anders Mole does this a lot. I got to watch him in uh, Montreal, and, and it just struck me that it's not really doing anything. It looks nice and it looks fluid, but I don't know if it's actually serving any purpose. It's have you you know what I'm talking about? It's almost like they're jogging up, right? And they're like they give a little bit of a of a juke, almost like they're like practicing what the hands that's going to feel like have you ever yeah. seen that before i've seen it in a lot of setters in yeah. my one year of high school wall there was this like a kid that we used to make fun of because he would shake his hands before every set yeah. um a lot of people like they uh, when they're imitating me setting they give one hard clap before they set mm -hmm. um and for me that was just like a sand thing and then it yeah. turns into even when i don't have sand on my hands i'm doing it now um I would I wouldn't read too much into it. <laughs> yeah, I I don't think it's like a I don't think it's a, a strategic thing. It's just probably just like they've maybe picked up a habit. No one coached them out of it. Now they still got it. <laughs> yeah, it's like if it ain't broke, you know. Like, yeah, right, right. Was, All right. He's, he's one of the best hands so, so I don't know if there's something to it or if it was just something he saw someone do and, and modeled it after somebody else. Well, Stratus Murder, uh, Mayor. Yeah. He does. He's like in sync with his steps, so it almost seems like it's like, oh, it's just kind of like the, the whiplash of his steps. I don't know. Yeah. Uh, of like, oh, it's just he's ready to set, but it's just steps as he's running up the set. So I don't know. It's a that is an interesting thing to think about that, but I don't I don't think it means anything either. Consider it like NBA, mm -hmm. like how everybody takes their foul shot, how everybody has like a noticeable different flair. Um, in their jump shot. And, and I love watching uh, like Instagram people who are imitating different NBA players and how they move, how they right. run and everything. And then there's this one story about Todd Rogers. Uh, you guys might've seen it on one of the videos in the library, but he, he had a slap tear uh, in his right arm. I think it was. Um, and so he couldn't move. And anytime he tried to bring his arms up at 45 degrees here, it would actually like get stuck and be really painful. And he used to practice every day in Santa Barbara on East Beach. And because he had this injury for so long, the only way that he could get his arm up was just kind of doing this. And it was painful, but he could do it. And he said that after a month of his injury, everyone in Santa Barbara looked like they were sitting like this or doing this little snake move with their hand <laughs> to set because they're like oh well well todd like he he lines it up with his eyes and his forearms and this is how you create more accuracy with a set and he was like i was crippled this is the only way i could get my hand up but people saw it they replicated it and that's what's kind of dangerous i guess about any industry where you see somebody doing it a certain way and they're successful and you're like that's why he's successful no calm down it might not be intentional it might not even be right um it makes you wonder yeah. what uh how many people are out there setting with three fingers like phil oh mm. my god too many <laughs> yeah i um, saw somebody setting with, with two fingers at our, at our camp i was like open your left hand and he did it immediately most people it takes them like a little yeah. while to yell at it but i was like open your left hand and he went bah! and then never did it again i was like this guy i want to coach him like yeah, right. one piece of feedback, immediate adaptation. Let's go. Um, so one of the more experienced players at, at our beach, um, he taught me recently that when he runs up to the set, he kind of has like a mini prayer hand position. 
Um, and he reckons that by having that prayer and then opening up, he's always opening his hands relatively the same distance. And uh, the question I had was, for him was, how do I reduce my doubling? And he's been teaching me that one. And I've actually noticed a lot of uh, progress that I, I feel like my hands are a lot more consistent on that front. Um, and maybe it draws back into your firearm analogy, Mark, but having that firearm ready earlier, you're ready to receive that ball. It'd be interesting to see a bunch of the befores and a bunch of afters to see when your hands were actually getting up, um, if that was the case. And DJ, one of our coaches at camps, he teaches that religiously. I mean, he says prayer and middle finger to nose. So if you stick your middle finger at your nose and you hold a prayer position, it puts you in the perfect setting because some people pray, but now your fingertips are still facing up. Mm -hmm. um, you have to like convert it to be weird. And then that's your position. Uh, and love that and successful for a lot of people. And yeah, you know, all these tricks, they can just do something that makes it work maybe inadvertently, which is, which is cool sometimes, you know, just like I say, like go to the opposite end of the spectrum of something. You're not actually telling them to do that, but if their in body interprets it enough so that when they think of that word, they do this action, then I'm done coaching. I'm, I don't really need you to understand that more unless you're going to become a coach. Then I need to talk to you about like, I gave you this feedback, not because that's what I wanted you to do, but because I needed you to get off of that other place. Um, and that's uh, the fun of coaching, figuring that stuff out. It's like, it's like in golf, if you hit five slices in a row, the coach always tells you, all right, now hit a draw. And then like, oh, you did it. Or you didn't do it. And you start feeling it, and then you tune it back in, just like you were saying. Love it. Yeah. yeah. All right. Um, Matt, what can we expect out of you Thursday? What's the game plan? AVP, oh. Manhattan Beach. Matt's uh, competing for his first yeah. name on the pier. That's the goal. Awesome. It's a. It looks like a pretty gnarly draw, too. It looks like, I mean, Manhattan, everybody just... Um, yeah. Joe from Florida. We put in a lot of work back in Florida, so it'll be uh, it'll be fun to just kind of see all that come. Kind of... I think he's gotten a nice little break off, which I think he needed, just like a couple like a reset for. And now he's uh, it seems like he's ready to go and uh, excited to compete. So uh, yeah, searching for that first main draw. So uh, I'm I'm excited about another opportunity. You're there every time right there uh so here's here's what i'll ask you is one thing that you could do hi logan <laughs> <laughs> logan weber joined the party everybody just listen to the all in the living room figures <laughs> nice uh Matt, I was giving matt uh, logan we kind of lost a little bit of that focus yesterday but uh matt if you could do one thing well offensively that you could focus on, one thing well that you could do defensively that you could focus on, and then one thing for your team. Because a lot of times in matches, and I've been there, you come in with this mindset, you remind yourself, hey, I'm going to do this technically, and then another problem arises, and you start chasing that, and you forgot to stay on task about what's the one thing that I told everybody and myself that would make me the most successful over time. And a lot of times I know that I've, I've lost track of that during competitive moments and then it became a crappy game or a crappy practice. So Matt, if you could do one thing that would make you the best offensive version of yourself, what would that be on Thursday? I think one that's been working for me a lot recently is be late. Just be really late. Keep the ball in front of me. Perfect. You can always speed up. I, I feel like I have a pretty fast approach. And for a while, it was just very aggressive with my last two steps. And I, I think that's pretty automatic now. So I think it's now more so about like staying behind the ball and to where I'm just barely getting to the ball uh, before it crosses my high speed. And it just makes everything so fast uh, to where 
to where the defense doesn't really have time to respond to it or mm-hmm. like catches a blocker that's not built all the way yet. Um, so, so being low in my attack, I think is, is a big thing that I want to train. And, and Great. Like, so when you inevitably shank a pass, but you win the point next play, are you going to say pass better? Make sure my hands are down. Or are you going to say be late? Still got to stick to the be late. Love it. Yeah. yeah you cool. I, because I, I feel like I've I've changed focuses so often in the past in a game. And it's like, that wasn't a game plan. What am I doing? <laughs> Changes everything. Uh, so it, that wasn't what I was mentally prepared to do. That I was really prepared to focus in on uh, for that day of comp- competing. And so I think just knowing, like, hey, I'm going to go into this because I know how to pass. Mm-hmm. I know how to pass. And so if because of a great serve, then it's a great job. But attacking is where I feel like I've lost the most points in my games. Uh, and so I just want to make sure that I stay geared in uh, and being late behind the ball so I can see the court uh, no matter where the set is. Um, mm. I think that that outweighs uh, maybe a great serve by them where I was maybe a bit out of system. Okay. So it's 15, 14, you, you're in the finals about to get your name on the pier. You dig Hagen's high line. Uh, what are you going to tell yourself? Um, be late. I love it. <laughs> you <gotta> be late. <laughs> not my name's about to get in a pier. Not I'm about to qualify. Not I'm getting my first, my first main draw right now. No, I'm going to chisel it off of his hands. I'm chiseling it off of his hands, and we're winning that game. <laughs> cool. Uh, one thing that did work for me, you know, late in the career was whatever my key was for that game or whatever the game plan was, because I know that I got loose with my mind um, during the rest of my career was I would just write it, write it on my hand, you know, and then that was, that was just always my reminder, like, okay, let's stay here. Let's stay focused. Let's stay meditative so that we can concentrate on that. And if more teams can stay on task for the one thing that they know what makes them great and not chase all the little tiny errors that happen and all the imperfections that happen all the time. Entrepreneurs, we we also know this. It's like, yes, there are a million inefficiencies in your business, but what is bringing in the best results? Just do that and do it to your max. Um, And then along the way, you can shore up some other little things, but do the one thing that's going to max you out. And then uh, ask that of your partner so that they can stay on task. And choose one for defense as well, so that you know that when you guys are serving, okay, I'm going to do this defensively, and then I'm going to be there. And then finally, uh, one for your team. And I think building each other up, getting hyped for each other, for a lot of people that works, but that has to be a conversation with your teammate as well. Of Do we want to play hyped? Is this going to be the best version of us, or do we want to play calm? Is this going to be the best version of us? And then reminding yourself where you want to be. Um, and when you get super fired up after a point, then, all right, let's bring it back down to where we were. That was very exciting. Congratulations. Hoorah. Let's bring it back to where we need to stay. And if you feel like your vibe or your energy, your emotions are not there, call that time out and say, Hey dude, I'm going to slap you in the face right now, just so we can get fired up. (laughs) Yeah. Uh, But find that moment and and find that energy for yourself and for your team. And then just a constant reminder to stay there. And that, that anchor to home of where you're going to be excellent. That will, that will hold you through some turbulent waters. Hagen and I made a rule of practice today for our last set, because we were both getting really frustrated that if either of us said anything negative, Slap them on the wrist, nice. <laughs> and it like conscious not have the super low lows during that set. Mm-hmm. You know, but it stopped us from having like the negative talk to ourselves. Our whole playing, it's like today's just not our day. Not a lot is going right. So like, what's the one control that's gonna help us get out? Of Awesome. <laughs> <Idiot>. <laughs>
All right. Um, members, thank you so much for being here and uh, for supporting us and our company. And we hope that we're supporting you in the best way possible. Logan, thanks for the guest appearance. <laughs> We're in his room, uh, so really, we're the guest. <laughs> well, yeah, that's nice. We'll pay, we'll pay you an office rental fee. <laughs> <laughs> um, and for everybody at home, if you guys want to be a part of this, if you're listening or you're watching, uh, the majority of this was not filmed. So we could see a little bit with Travis. We did some film and a little bit with Mike. That was at the beginning. But if you listen to this, you can always find the companion video on YouTube. Just head to our podcast playlist or our online coaching video analysis. And if you want to get in and get trained by us and our staff and have these meetings yourself, head to betteratbeach.com forward slash coaching and uh, you can be a part of it. Cool, everybody? Sounds great. Cool. Awesome. All right. Uh, we should see you guys on Thursday, but that's tentative. We will communicate with you since uh, Matt is playing in the quali, and I have seven teams requesting that I coach them in the qualifier. Uh, but I also <laughs> have two sets of family who's going to be here, so <laughs> I got to figure out what I got to do. <laughs> yeah, up it from zero, Logan. Yeah. <laughs> 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 awesome and if you are at home and you're watching uh stop by the better at beach tent uh me and my family will be there when i'm not coaching so would love to see you there and we got these new swags coming we got the nice polyester blend uh long sleeve hoodies that are the spf really and sweat wicking yeah what so the back looks really good on those i i agree. i think it does uh, but we put the new one on the butt so now better at beach uh says it it says better beach on the butt. Oh, more people out there. Nice. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> cool. Uh, guys, if you're in the recording, if you could leave your browser open for a little while so that it could upload, that would be great. And I'll see you guys in the Facebook group. Everybody else, see you on the sand. Bye-bye. Good luck, Matt. <laughs>